Welcome to the John Brown University Chapel podcast, recorded in the historic Cathedral of the Ozarks in Salem Springs, Arkansas. This week's chapel message is from me, Tracy Balzer, Director of Christian Formation and Assistant Professor of Christian Formation. So, we're still in the book of Acts, as we will be through the end of the semester, a hefty book. And last time I was up here talking with you, I was sort of, I just followed Dr. Pollard's um, address on the first chapter. I talked about the second chapter. And um, so just as a review, remember that in the second chapter, this is when the church begins to come together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. This is sounding like a revival to me. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. This fledgling church was electrified unified. I can't help but wonder what it must have been like to be there, to be so connected to the Spirit of God and to each other. It must have been thrilling. But it didn't take long before things started to heat up because the church went public, right? Healings and teachings and miracles and growing numbers led to court appearances and imprisonments for Peter and John, and it led to the first Christian martyr, Stephen, which leads us to chapter 8, and that's where we are today. So before we continue, please pray with me. Holy Spirit, you would come and be our teacher in this time. Illuminate your word that we might know and love you more, that we might grow in unity as your people and that we might receive your direction humbly. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Well, I do love a good movie and I'm glad that movie theaters did not disappear with the advent of DVDs and streaming services. I love going to the theater and having the full experience, the sound, the recliners, the food that will now be delivered to me. But as my movie-going friends will attest, and and we will now and then go to movies with Becky or my sister, we love to go to movies together, they will know that Carrie and I like to stay to the very end of the movie. And what that means is that we stay till the end of the credits, okay? Because... I feel like everyone on that production team should be recognized. They won't know that we're doing it, but I somehow feel that by just reading their names, we are congratulating them. Like, well done, best boy. And way to go, gaffer. You know, these, these names that nobody knows, but, but they participated in this amazing artistic creation. I also love to see like, oh look, there's a whole list of names that sort of have an Indian flavor to them. Maybe they're the animation team or the special effects team. And I think, okay, that's where they contracted out that part of the movie. I mean, I really don't know much about making movies, but reading those credits teaches me a lot about what it takes to put it together. There are often hundreds of names that make that movie happen. And I feel like they all should be recognized for their part in it. I came across a quote recently that explains this a little bit better than I, I think quite a bit better. The quote goes like this. Certain authors, speaking of their works, say, my book, my commentary, my history, etc." They would do better to say, our book our commentary, our history, I'll insert, our movie. Because there is 
in them usually more of other people than their own. That quote actually came from Blaise Pascal who lived in the 17th century. But I love his, his understanding that any work requires more than just one. It requires more than the celebrities that you see on the red carpet. Hundreds of people are behind it. Well, the story of the early church has leading roles for sure. Peter, John, Paul, the Holy Spirit, Stephen. But there are so many, many small roles. Some characters are not even ever named, like Oh, the 3,000 that were added to their number in chapter 2. Perhaps those are the extras in movie speak. Now, last week, Dr. Bennett took us through chapter 7, where Stephen, one of those leading roles, I think, is martyred. And Saul, the one who would be converted and whose name would be changed to Paul, Saul is approving that murder, the martyrdom of Stephen. And we begin to feel the needle move in the life of the church. So, we pick it up in chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now, there's a good bit of foreshadowing here, but this is where we're going to leave Saul for now. Today, we're looking at the first part of Acts 8, where we encounter two names that if Acts were a movie, and the actors were listed not in order of appearance, but in order of prominence, we might have to sit and wait a while to see their names. But I want to find out who was in this story. And I trust that it will be worth sitting through the credits. And heads up, I have a lot of scripture that's coming up on these screens, so buckle up. Okay, first we meet Philip, beginning in, in verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all played, paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Okay, Philip, who is this guy? Well, he is not the apostle. Philip, okay? This Philip is one of the men who were earlier chosen to help with the distrib distribution of food. This happens in chapter 6. And he was chosen because, like the others in that group, he was full of the Spirit and of wisdom. Stephen, who was just tragically and dramatic, dramatically martyred, was his colleague. He was one in that same group. And this is where we get the um, concept of the role of deacon. Okay, those seven were servants, and that's where we get the word for deacon. So here we read um, in this passage that persecution has heated up, and the believers were scattered, and Philip leaves Jerusalem and goes to the Gentiles in Samaria. So just a reminder about Samaria, what was particular about that area. It had been populated by people who were relocated there by the king of Assyria around 700 BC, okay, over 700 years ago from the time of this story. And they only became Samaritans because they were relocated there. Over time, those people began to adopt some of the Jewish practices, and that resulted in a syncretistic expression of Judaism. So it's for this reason that the Jews in Jerusalem considered them anathema. They were not true Jews and therefore considered to be Gentiles. How amazing it is then that Philip, the one-time food server, became a gifted and powerful evangelist to serve the very people that the Jews had avoided. Perhaps he had heard the story of Jesus who stopped and spoke to a Samaritan woman, the last person that his culture told him he should be speaking to. 
that surely would have given Philip vision and some courage. Philip's story is an example of how the Holy Spirit can overcome our biases and empower us for service, even in the places we've avoided and to the people that we've considered to be outsiders. Now, incredibly, these syncretistic Samaritans respond with belief and even baptism in the name of Jesus. Perhaps some of them remembered the story that was going around about a woman telling them that this man, Jesus, told me everything I ever did. So again, Philip, this new character, down on the list. Philip was originally chosen to help serve food, but then he became an effective evangelist to the Samaritans. Now, when I go see a movie that I've particularly enjoyed, I often go home and look up the IMDb listing, okay? I really do like to see who all the cast was, what they look like, any little interesting tidbit about them, and so I did the same with Philip. And this is what I learned. Much later in Acts, I mean, we really only hear about Philip in chapter 8. Well, we learn hear about him in 6 when he's selected, but in chapter 8, we hear more about him. Later on, we see this, and Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, says in Acts 21, leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. And then this random comment. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Wow, Philip, four powerful women in your house. Well done, Dad. These women were prophetic, truth-telling preachers, and that is absolutely all we are told. But as I put this picture together in my mind, I couldn't help but think of this picture. Four powerful, spirit-filled women telling the truth, right? Did you feel it that night, those days that they were here? I loved that. And that's sort of how I imagined Philip's daughters to be. But honestly, we only get one sentence about them. But there's some, another little tidbit about Philip. So Philip is a biblical figure that I think doesn't really get enough press. He's sort of buried in the story of the early church. But when we take time to look we see a man who is mighty in the things of the Spirit, a gifted, passionate leader and communicator, obedient to the call of Christ, and he raises four amazing daughters to do the same. This is very impressive to me, and it's a story that can get lost in the credits. But on Thursday, sorry, on Friday, this is family week, right? Family weekend. On Friday, we have an extra chapel. Dr. Pollard will be speaking more about Philip. He's going to take the second half of this chapter. So you'll hear more about him then. Now, continuing on, in verse 9, we encounter another character that gets lost in the credits, I think. And these verses say, starting with 9, Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. Now, I want to just say here that many Bible scholars believe that Simon's sorcery was dark and occultic. And here we see that it held the Samaritans in its grip. Simon wielded a great deal of power and prestige. So continuing on in 12. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So they moved from Simon to Philip, from darkness to light. Simon was a big deal in town, but in comes Philip, the Christian, the Jew, who was willing to engage and share the good news. And all of Simon's fans seemingly turned to Philip. The Samaritans responded to Philip's message, and interestingly, we see in the next verse, Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So Philip, who we just met, is having a massive influence. Let's see what happens next. 
In verse 14, we find these, this um, information. When the apostles in Jerusalem, okay, Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had heard the accept, and accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Jerusalem has taken notice of what is going on in these people who were otherwise seen as outcasts. And so they sent Peter and John to lay hands on them so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And it is a gesture from Jerusalem to say that yes, this faith is real. It is not just for the Jews, it is for everyone. But what about Simon, the purveyor of dark magic, the sorcerer? He recognized in Philip a higher power than his own. The influence and power that Philip wielded drew him in and he was fixated on Philip's leadership, his abilities, his form of magic. In chapter 8, 18, we read, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with your money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Let's look at that slide again. And this time, listen carefully to the language that Peter uses. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. My question to you, when you hear that, do you think Peter's words to Simon are unjustly harsh? Or is his correction warranted? When we are being corrected, or when we are the ones doing the correcting, it's critical that we understand that there is a profound difference between shame and guilt. When I wanted to understand this difference, I went to the expert, Brene Brown, right? This is her academic work. She researches shame for her. That's her vocation. And she gives some helpful definitions here. She says, I define shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. Now, maybe you can think of ways that unkindness was thrust upon you as you were growing up, completely unwarranted. You were a victim of verbal or social or maybe even physical abuse that was not of your doing. It made you feel unworthy of love, unworthy of belonging, which is not true of any human being because each of us are made in the image of God. Simple illustration. When I was kindergarten, in kindergarten, I was walking home from school. Back in the day, you could walk home by yourself because actually mom was at the corner waiting for me. I'm walking home on this side of the street. She's on the other side of the street. I see her over there. And out of this house comes tearing this little boy down his, down his front walk through the, the front gate and comes to me and punches me in the stomach and then runs back in. What a turkey. <laughs> I 
like, I don't deserve this, right? But you know what? It's still in my memory. That is sort of a humorous illustration, but it's to show you like, here, I'm going to gut punch you and make you feel like you are unworthy of anything more than that. That is shame. Okay, but let's look at it compared to guilt. Brene Brown says that I believe that guilt, on the other hand, is adaptive and helpful. It's holding something we've done or failed to do up against our values and feeling a psychological discomfort. I think from a Christian worldview, we can adapt that even just a little bit. That guilt is holding something we've done or failed to do up against God's values and commands and feeling a psychological, emotional, and spiritual discomfort. Okay, you got that? Guilt is holding something we've done or failed to do up against God's values and commands and feeling psychological, emotional, spiritual discomfort. And Brene Brown says that that is adaptive and helpful. So knowing that, we go back to Peter's words to Simon. Was he inflicting shame or was he revealing guilt? And there we have those words again. Obviously, I think it's pretty clear that Simon's sin was no small thing. Peter used very strong words. I don't think this is shame. I think this is guilt. He tried to buy what was a gift of God. This is pure quid pro quo. You might have heard that term recently. This for that. Simon gives you money, you get the gift of God, right? But Simon is setting the terms of the deal. I give you money, you give me power. Have you ever made a deal with God? Now, maybe you haven't tried to pay God off in order to gain power or wealth. I think that's what Simon was doing. But have you ever operated out of a more sort of transactional approach to your faith? that if you just do everything right, God will surely bless you. This for that. I came upon a good description of what I think happens more often among professing Christians than we think. And this writer said, I once spoke with a man who shared with me, I did everything I could do in 21 years, I was married, to be a good Christian husband and father. I attended men's Bible studies, I went to church, I learned about parenting, I loved my wife. Then one day, out of the blue, she came home and told me that she didn't want to be married anymore. I was shocked. I was so angry at God. I had done everything. I had followed all the rules, but it didn't work. The writer says, tears filled this man's eyes. I'm still there, he said. I still feel that God betrayed me. As we talked, I thought about the deals we make with God and that some of them are unspoken. We can make them without realizing what we're doing. And then later, like this man, we find out that the deal was actually one-sided. He may have been unaware of it, but he had made a deal with God. God, I'll do my part and you do yours. I'll be a good husband in return you'll give me what I want. You'll spare me from pain. If you understand your relationship with God in a transactional way, you give him this, he gives you that, I want to tell you that you're headed for a faith crisis, one that will convince you that God is unfaithful and untrustworthy. Because you know what? Even if you do everything right, you will still experience pain. And it will not seem fair. And you'll be mad at God for not keeping up his end of the bargain. And the bargain isn't broken just because you're experiencing undue pain. You'll also look around you and see selfish, godless people everywhere who seem to experience nothing but blessings. This is yet another piece of experience to convince you that God is unfaithful. A transactional relationship with God will invariably lead you to a life of disappointment, bitterness, and anger. 
Now, this is not easy to grasp because our world is dominated by transactional relationships. But God's way is different, higher, and healing, full of grace and mercy. It is hard for us to break the habit of earning love. Psalm 73 has been foundational in my life of faith for many years, and I go to it often for all kinds of reasons, but I encourage you to go there. If you find yourself thinking right now, I actually have a transactional relationship with God, because you will find in Psalm 73 that the writer himself struggled with the reality of seeing the wicked around him prosper, and yet what does he get for living a pure life? He says it's all in vain and that it put him in this place of anger. You see in Psalm 73 that he got to such a point of anger and confusion that he thought his foot would slip. He thought it was all over, a faith crisis. But then he entered into the sanctuary of God in a new way and saw God for who he was and learned important things. I am always with you, he said. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. He says, my flesh and my heart will fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So if you are struggling with that kind of misunderstanding of grace, I encourage you to spend some time in Psalm 73, and then I'd love for you to send me a note and tell me about it. So, here are some takeaways from this beginning, this first half of the chapter of Acts. One is that shame is the message that you are flawed and unworthy of love. And if that's the message you get, it is always evil. Guilt however, is the awareness that we have done or failed to do what God has asked or commanded. And it's meant to be productive. It leads to repentance, which leads to healing and freedom. And thirdly, making deals with God is never appropriate. You cannot buy or earn what God offers as a gift. We love because he first loved us, not the other way around. So what might you have to say to God about this today. The band's gonna come, and in the middle of this final song, you will have some time to offer your response to God in prayer. Thanks for listening to this episode of the John Brown University Chapel Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on, and we'd love it if you would leave us a review.